All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, tonight, I'm presenting my project, Leveraging Blockchain in the Supply Chain to Compete as a Small to Medium Enterprise Manufacturer. Here's a quick look at my table of contents. Um, so for this problem, I really wanted to focus on a work-related problem. So I work for a lithium-ion battery manufacturer. Um, and in this industry, there exists a very complex international supply chain for the raw ingredients. Um, these are metals and minerals found all over the world with different logistical, um, ethical, and political uh, concerns um, when they're gathered and imported. Um, Overall, there's been rapid growth and expansion in this industry. Um, demand has been greatly outpacing supply. And for this reason, many countries and companies are really scrambling to secure these materials. Uh, for example, Ford just announced a series of deals to secure their raw material directly with mines to um, meet their production demands through 2026 for their EV batteries. And there's been an increased uh, national security focus. Um, for example, in the United States, the Biden and Trump administrations have both announced different executive orders to strengthen supply chains and um, increase investment in domestic sources for these materials. So the company I work for would be classified as a small to medium enterprise or an SME. We um, uh, employ under 250 people. Our annual revenue is under $50 million. And this class of business, uh, because of its size, has a lot of challenges stemming from its lack of resources, whether it be um, financial, human, or technological. Um, and overall, it's just uh, difficult for an SME size company to compete with larger companies, especially in this industry. Um, so the uh, technology I want to focus on tonight is blockchain, which is a distributed digital ledger that stores data history in timestamp blocks. This is a programmable system of sharing and storing information across all nodes on a network. And this continuous chain of blocks can't be altered without a full consensus of the nodes. Um, and this P2P, peer-to-peer uh, -peer nature enables trust and security, which gives data um, properties such as being immutable, transparent, verifiable, traceable, and decentralized. And it enables um, business tools such as transaction verifications, audits, smart contracts, and digital chains of custody. So the problem I wanted to address was how can SME manufacturers use blockchain to improve efficiency and secure raw materials to succeed amongst its large global competition. Um, the focus uh, of this study was to focus on two typical SME problems those being inefficient inventory practices and insufficient data collection. And the objectives of this was to understand our inventory for all the materials we buy on the open market, identify the crucial raw materials, um, identified two systematically, uh, identified two crucial raw materials to do a more of an in-depth look at, and then map out the data gaps for these materials uh, as we take an upstream look at um, their supply chains. And the goals of this project were to observe these problems, learn from them, and then identify um, the appropriate blockchain solutions we'd want to use here and kind of just use my company and its data as a case study. So quickly, I'll just hit on some literature review, um, some interesting statistics I'd read, um, two on blockchain adoption by SMEs. So SME manufacturers lag behind other industrial business categories when it comes to industry 4.0 transformation. Less than 5% of South Korean SME manufacturers surveyed classified as smart manufacturing adopters and industry 4.0 adoption in two other Asian countries was under 20%. Uh, additionally, in another study, only a small portion of SMEs surveyed in Ireland had data sufficient for use in advanced simulations where it's required high quality and high quantities of, of data. Um, these SMEs did not collect as much data as larger enterprises and were less ready to adopt sophisticated data collections um, than their non-SME counterparts. And just some studies on the benefits of blockchain. One is researchers in Thailand tested the effectiveness of a data-driven decision support tool at an SME-sized bakery. And three months after implementation, they had material uh, spending reduction of over $3,000 per day. Average on-hand inventory cost was slashed by um, over half. And these results showed that data-powered inventory models could provide accurate recommendations for an SME to realize inventory cost savings. And using blockchain, lastly, um, Walmart was able to trace a pack of, a random pack of mangoes off its store shelf to its um, source farm in 2.2 seconds and before blockchain that pre that process had previously taken them seven days so the data i was able to collect came from my company's um, erp system i analyzed 125 of our buy materials or materials we source in the open market um, i looked at manufacturing orders which shows like consumption data internally um, as we make our work in progress inventory or final inventory i looked at purchase orders and i looked at 
on hand inventory at the time of doing this study. Um, of the 125 materials, 22 of them were labeled critical materials by my company. And this is their definition. Um, the company's definition is it's essential to support continuous production of cell quantities in various chemistries and their supply, lead time, and procurement challenges associated with foreign vendors or sole source suppliers requiring significant qualification effort for substitution. So many of these materials we only have one source for uh, because we require really uh, high grade in a lot of these materials. Um, additional data was collected from our ERP. Um, our material specs, certs, quality control documents from supplier websites, from quotes and reaching out to suppliers um, from our internal database and paper records, and then uh, through consulting with our company experts. The models of analysis I used, um, so I compiled kind of a master Excel spreadsheet of all this data, which took significant effort to gather it all and then clean it, all the data for use to remove errors and um, things of that nature. So I built uh, four inventory models, uh, descriptive analytics, two ABC analyses, and a scatter plot, um, and then two data models. Uh, I'll try to just cruise through these pretty quickly. And then at the end, if anyone has any questions, I could definitely loop back and I'll be happy to answer more questions on them. So this is a look at our buy materials and critical materials. So these are summary statistics that were calculated for every single material. Um, first, we have supply on hand in years, which is how long the, the stock would last at current consumption rates um, calculated and displayed in years of stock on hand. Then we have inventory turnover ratio. So how many times we're turning over that inventory in one year. And then for the 22 critical materials, I was able to calculate the last lead time. This is a manual process I had to look up purchase orders and receipt dates and do the math manually. So I can only do it for um, those materials just due to time constraints of this study. But what we're looking at here is just summary statistics, um, averages and things like that of all these products. So this is an ABC analysis of our buy materials. This was done based on uh, dollar value used per year. So the value of these materials um, that are consumed every single year based on the amount consumed and the value of them. Um, so this is the 125 buy materials. Uh, we have our A materials here, which represent 80% of the dollar value of the material consumed. Um, and we have the B and C below. The C couldn't all fit on here. Um, but these materials, the A materials, actually made up 15% of all the materials. So not quite 80-20, but pretty close. And then same concept here for our critical materials. We identified seven A-level critical materials based on the value of the material consumed every year. I thought this is a good equalizer instead of comparing grams and gallons and meters of material, just the dollar value of what it's worth um, consumed every year. And um, it's important to note here that all the A-level materials here were also A on the uh, previous ABC. So this scatter plot here is a chart comparing annual consumption in dollars versus years of stock on hand. I limited the scope down to 14 materials with under 10 years of stock on hand. These are materials the company will have to secure in the relative future. Um, so the most critical area would be the top left where it's lowest on years of stock on hand and highest on annual consumption value of the materials. And I uh, used this chart to select the two materials I wanted to look at further. Uh, the criteria being um, their location on this chart being based in an, an element or mineral, mineral or mined material around the world, um, having a shelf life consideration. So it's going to run out. We're going to need some more. Can't last forever on the shelves. And um, being an A tier material in those previous analyses. So for that reason, I chose the copper foil and lithium salt on this chart. And I think they're pretty representative of typical lithium ion batteries materials that all manufacturers are going to be competing for of all kinds of sizes. So this right here, I'll try to go through fast, but it's a um, data gap visualization table. It represents um, the two materials we want to take a look at from their use down to the mine. So there's two vendors uh, we use for the copper foil there. Um, so as we go down the chart, we go further upstream in the supply chain and our data sources are getting further away from the company. So for our direct suppliers, we know stuff like their locations, their logistical information, um, procurement information, but as we go down, these gray blocks are gonna represent the unknown or vague data we don't have. Um, so for these materials, I can only trace their support, their sources back to Japan, even though um, what, from what we know about these materials, they're most likely 
come from South America or Australia, typically routed through China. Um, so this is as far as we can see on these materials, but you know, we don't really know exactly where they come from previous to China. And there's a danger in that. We don't know how global events might impact these supply chains. We don't know if they're shared um, suppliers or mines further upstream. So we're not really diversifying two sources of copper if they come from the same place. Um, and we can't certify this stuff as conflict free if we ever had to do that for a regulatory reason. So I wanted to see in this fishbone why these data gaps would exist. So I pretty much dialed it down to four potentials. Um, either it's not the information is not provided by the suppliers or we're not requesting it. Um, or if we do receive it, we're not properly collecting and retaining it. Or uh, if we do store it away, uh, there's we have trouble mining it and finding it in our system. And there's all these different contributing factors that go into it. And then I used um, other company experts to take a look at this and determine the most likely contributors for those materials. So the overall results of our data would be um, quality suffers from accessibility and integrity issues. It was a challenge to gather all the data together um, to clean up um, errors. Um, it was siloed in different parts of the ERP system, splintered across different revision levels and locations in the facility. And some parts had two different part numbers for some reason for the exact same material. A lot of different conversions had to be done. And overall, this information wasn't really ready for an analyst to use often, and doing this effort often would be expensive and time consuming. Um, the two highly critical materials that I identified I couldn't trace back to its supply chain source. Um, the most likely contributing factors, based on talking with um, company experts and vendors, is legal barriers where there's a, a lack of an NDA in place, so a vendor wouldn't want to disclose that, a fear of us damaging the relationship. If we request to require the information, they might um, not want to do business with us anymore. Um, or a lack of retention or conversion. So it's likely we got some piece of information about its logistical source um, in a paper form that just wasn't stored, was thrown away or something like that, or wasn't uploaded to a computer. Um, as far as the inventory, I think our critical materials are properly identified. They lined up very well with the ABC level A materials, but it's in a static form. So if conditions changed, if um, our requirements changed, if the industry changed, um, and if we scaled up, maybe we're not still, those uh, labels still wouldn't apply for those critical materials. Um, we have a large, very large buffer of safety stock existing. Over half of our buy materials have over 10 years of stock on hand based on our usage. Um, the average year supply on our critical materials over 36 years, um, even with some big outliers in those in that data, moving the average up, there's still over, I think, I think eight or 10 of the materials were over 10 years of stock for our critical materials. Um, our average inventory turnover was less than one time per two years. Ideally, you want to be turning it over four to seven times for, per material. And our average lead time for these critical materials is 56.59 days, which is pretty high, but it doesn't justify having these massive levels of inventory. And the bottlenecks we observed would be limitations in data availability and data quality and massive inventory buffers preventing more efficient inventory practices from being used. So the blockchain recommendations I would make based on this analysis and findings um, would be the following blockchain enabled solutions. We'd wanna participate in a supplier marketplace with live market of buyer and, data, buyer and seller data with blockchain verified product information and supplier performance records. This would have the benefits of trust enablement, lowering the barriers for us to do business with different parties. Uh, could, feature continuous audits, so we're not relying on static audit data done once. Um, we can perform them constantly. We could rely on other people's audit data that are shared with us, and it provides incentives for the suppliers to perform better. And then we have the benefit of gathering more location data, so companies can, uh, like us, can ensure global diversification, diversification of our sources. Um, we should require digital chains of custody with our materials. In them could be source data, testing certificates, and logistical custody, um, all that information bundled together. Um, so we know who's handling these materials and its origins, and we can trace these materials better to um, mitigate against different risks. And we'd want to use smart contracts. So we'd want to use um, automatic transactions. These contracts would allow for more automated data collection. So the quantity and quality of data would go up. And by integrating with other supply chain partners, um, the integration required to do this would give us more. Um, better data, better options, 
for more suppliers um, and we can it can enable um, data sharing that would enable just in time or lean inventory practices and all in all this could improve the company's bottom line and make the company more efficient so it can compete um, the recommendations i'd make for the company would be to keep identifying those a level and critical materials um, they're subject to change as this industry changes and um, technology changes for these batteries uh, we want to prepare for industry and supply chain integration with blockchain tools that I mentioned, hire people, understand this stuff, invest in the infrastructure, know who's using blockchain in our circles and our network, the customers, partners, suppliers, competitors, and ERP providers, um, and know our way into those networks, which middleware softwares we might need so we can uh, communicate with other ERP systems and enable this blockchain level of data sharing. And overall, just have a strategy uh, conduct a cost benefit analysis on um, integrating this uh, blockchain and hire consultants who can help us do that. In conclusion, SMEs need to need to prepare for global competition in growing industries with supply chain complexities, such as a lithium ion battery industry. Um, this industry is going to keep changing and competition is only going to go up. Uh, so we have to companies like SMEs and our company have to be more efficient to survive through it. Um, in this study, two typical SME problems were showcased and analyzed, these being the inefficient inventory and insufficient data, and they kind of go hand in hand and can feed off each other um, and have to be improved together. And I think when you improve one, it's gonna, you're going to see results in the improvement of the other. Um, blockchain solutions are here. They enable trust between parties that might otherwise have low levels of trust to do business. There's verification traceability and transparency in the data, and it enables more automated processes. Um, these tools tie nicely into smart manufacturing, machine learning, AI, other industry 4.0 tools, and there's strength in numbers. So the more parties using blockchain, the more parties in the network, the stronger the blockchain network is, and the more secure the data and the better data quality. And overall, just don't be static, continuously audit vendors we use, vendors we might use, could possibly use, um, just to diversify those material sources and know our ABC materials and most critical materials, as I referenced before, um, since they're subject to change and they're important to understand and gather information on. And overall, just prepare for integration. Uh, and with a stat that by 2025, uh, about 10%, it's expected that 10% of the global economy will be using blockchain. So the, net, the time to prepare for that would be now. Uh, I just want to thank all the Towson Supply Chain Management professors here, specifically Dr. Nag for his guidance and support on this project. Um, and thank you to my company for providing access to our data. And with that, uh, is there any questions?